Good afternoon, y'all. Good to be here with y'all for session four of our uh, Walter Rodney reading of uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. We're going to be starting um, section 2.2 of chapter two, titled Some Concrete Examples, where we'll be going in to real world examples of different parts of Africa being uh, underdeveloped. Um, chapter Two poor section 2.2 is a pretty long one, so we're going to split it up. So, in terms of the document, we're going to go from Egypt to uh, on which is starting on page 76 of the doc down to 98, uh, page 98, and uh, they will finish from 98 to 115 uh, next Tuesday or whenever we meet next if something happens to get in the way of meeting next Tuesday. So, uh Without any further ado, let's get started with this May 4th, 2021 reading of uh, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney, starting with uh, Section A, Egypt. So, it is logical to start with Egypt as the oldest culture in Africa, which rose to eminence. The glories of Egypt under the pharaohs are well known and do not need recounting. At one time, it used to be said or assumed that ancient Egypt was not African, a curious view which is no longer seriously propounded. However, for the present purposes, it is more relevant to refer to Egypt under Arab and Turkish rule from the 7th century onwards. During that latter period, the ruling class was formed, and that meant that Egypt's internal development was tied up uh, with other countries, notably Arabia and Turkey. Colonized Egypt sent abroad great amounts of wealth in the form of food and revenue, and that was a very negative factor. But the tendency was for the ruling foreigners to deal with their own imperial masters and to act simply as a ruling elite within Egypt, which became an independent feudal state. One of the first features of feudalism to arrive in Egypt was the military aspect. The Arabs, Turks, and Circassian invaders were all militarily inclined. This was particularly true of the Mamluks, who held power from the 13th century onwards. Political power in Egypt from the 7th century lay in the hands of a military oligarchy, which delegated the actual government to bureaucrats, thereby creating a situation similar to that in places like China and Indochina. Even more fundamental um, was the fact that land tenure relations were undergoing change in such a way that a true feudal class um, came on the scene. All the conquerors made land grants to their followers and military captains. Initially, the land in Egypt was the property of the state to be rented out to cultivators. The state then had the right to reappropriate the land and allocate it once more somewhat like the head of a village community acting as the guardian of the lands of related families. However, the ruling military elements also became a new class of landowners. By the 15th century, most of the land in Egypt was the property of the Sultan and his military lords. If there was a small class which monopolized most of the land, it followed that there was a large class of landless. Peasant cultivators were soon converted into mere agricultural laborers, tied to the soil as tenants or vassals of the feudal landlords. These peasants, with little or no land, were known as the Falahin. In Europe, there are, few, there are legends about the exploitation and suffering of the Russian serfs or uh, muzik under feudalism. In Egypt, the exploitation of the Falahin was carried out even more thoroughly. The feudalists had no interest in the Falahin um, beyond seeing what they produced, that they reduced, produced revenue. Most of what the peasants produced was taken from them in the form of tax, and the tax collectors were asked to perform the miracle of taking from the peasants, even that which they did not have. When their demands were not met, the peasants were brutalized. Talk about a familiar fucking thing. The antagonistic nature of the contradiction between the feudal warrior landlords and the Falahin uh, was revealed by a number of peasant revolts, notably in the early part of the 8th century. 
In no continent was feudalism an epoch of romance for the laboring classes, but the elements of development were seen in the technology and the increase in productive capacity under the patronage of the Fatima dynasty, 969 AD to 1170 NN. Science flourished and industry reached a new level in Egypt. Windmills and water wheels were introduced from Persia in the, ninth, in the 10th century. Uh, new industries were introduced, paper making, sugar, refining, um, porcelain, and the distillation of gasoline. The older industries of textiles, leather, and metal were improved upon. The succeeding dynasties of the Ayyubids and the Mamluks also achieved a great deal, especially in the building of canals, uh, dams, bridges, and aqueducts, and in stimulating commerce with uh, Europe. Egypt at the time uh, was still able to teach new uh, many things. It was flexible enough to receive new techniques in turn. Although feudalism was based on the land, it usually developed towns at the expense of the countryside. Although feudalism was based on the land, it usually developed towns at the expense of the countryside. The high points of Egyptian feudal culture were associated with the towns. Uh, the Fatimids uh, founded the city of Cairo, which became one of the most famous and most cultured in the world, seat to the legendary Arabian Nights. At the same time, they established the Azhar University, which exists today as one of the oldest in the world. The feudalists and the rich merchants were the ones who benefited most, but the craftsmen and other city dwellers of Cairo, Alexandria, were able to participate to some extent in the leisure um, lives of the towns. We're talking here about uh, the specific trajectory of how, uh, how things in Egypt worked, so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about it. Uh, so one of the things uh, Rodney brought up is this, what was the word that he called these, uh, that he said these people were called? Uh, the Fellahan. I had never heard that word before. So the Fellahan are peasants with little or no land. And he said in Europe, there are legends about the exploitation and the suffering of the Russian serfs or muzik under feudalism. In Egypt, the exploitation of the Fellahan or the people, the peasants with little or no land, was carried out more thoroughly. The, the, he, he said the feudalists had no interest in these falahin um, beyond seeking what um, what they what they could produce revenue wise. Now, most of what the peasants produced was taken from them in the form of tax, and the tax collectors were asked to form the miracle of taking from the peasants even that which they did not have. They were brutalized when their demands were not met. Met. We can see very clearly that this. Uh, relation of um, the holders of what we would today think of as capital uh, being in a position where they brutalize uh, workers who cannot produce what it is they want uh, quite literally um, trends to be true uh, all across history. Um, you know, so in the, in the context of the Falehan, it might be um, quite literally uh, being beat um, by whatever the equivalent of a feudal uh, what's the word I'm looking for guard might be uh, today the capitalist can't can't literally whip your ass for not being able to be productive but they can do things like oh I don't know limit your bathroom breaks at an Amazon warehouse so that you have to necessarily uh, piss in a pot in order to meet productivity and keep your job or face the economic devastation that comes from being underemployed or under unemployed altogether in this economy. So that's a really interesting uh, thing Rodney's bringing up here. Uh, of course, if anybody has a point they want to bring up, they can type stack in the chat and I'll call on y'all. He also said the antagonistic um, nature of the contradiction um, between the feudal warrior landlords and the Falahan was revealed by a number of peasant revolts, notably in the early part of the 8th century. Uh, in no continent was feudalism an epoch of romance for the laboring classes, but the elements of development were seen in the technology and the increase in productive capacity. 
under the patronage of the Fatimi dynasty, 969 AD to 1170 NN, science flourished and industry reached a new level. Windmills and water mills were produced from Persia in the 10th century. New industries were introduced to paper making, sugar, refining, pork laying, and the distillation of gasoline. So we start to look at the fact that coercive labor does do a pretty good job, you know, at, at, at development in terms of just, uh, in terms of just, uh, creating the capacity for new uh industry but it does not at all trend across history that productivity and an increase in productivity um necessarily connects with the uh with better conditions for the actual people doing the labor and that's just a theme that continues to pop up as a uh, rodney brings up um, some of these examples ethiopia too at the start of its history as a great power was ruled over by foreigners. The kingdom of Aksum was one of the most important nuclei uh, around which feudal, feudal Ethiopia eventually emerged. And Aksum was founded near the Red Sea coast by a dynasty of uh, Sabian origin from the other side of the Red Sea. But the kings of Aksum were never agents of foreign powers, and they became completely Africanized. The founding of Axum goes back to the first century ND and its ruling class uh, was Christianized within a few centuries. After they moved inland and participated in the development of the Christian uh, feudal Ethiopian state, the Ethiopian, Tigrian, and Amoric ruling class was a proud one, tracing its descent to Solomon. Let's see. As a state which incorporated several other smaller states and kingdoms, it was an empire um, in the same sense as feudal Austria or Prussia. The emperor of Ethiopia was addressed as conquering lion of the tribe of Judah, elect of God, emperor of Ethiopia, king of kings. Uh, in practice, however, the Solomonic line was not uh, unbroken. Most of the consolidation of the inland Ethiopian uh, plateau was carried out in the 12th century by an intruding dynasty, the Zagwe, uh, who made claims to descent from Moses. The Zagwe kings distinguished themselves by building several churches cut out of solid rock. The architectural achievements attest to the level of skill reached by Ethiopians as well as the capacity of the state to mobilize labor on a huge scale. Such task uh, could not have been achieved by voluntary family labor, but only through the labor of an exploited class. A great deal is known of the superstructure of the Ethiopian culture, especially its Christianity and its literate culture. History was written to glorify the king and the nobility, especially under the restored Solomonic dynasty, which replaced the Zagwe in 1270 AD. Fine. Uh, illuminated books and manuscripts became a prominent element of emirate culture. Equally fine garments and jewelry were produced for the ruling class uh, and for the church. The, the top ecclesiastics were part of the nobility, and the institution of the monastery grew to great proportions in Ethiopia. The association of organized religion with the uh, state was implicit in communal societies. Uh, where the distinction between politics, economics, religion, medicine, uh, etc. was scarcely drawn. Under feudalism everywhere, um, church and state was in close alliance. The Buddhists were preeminent in feudal Vietnam, Burma, Japan, and to a lesser extent in China. Uh, in India, a limited Buddhist influence was overwhelmed by that of the Hindus and Muslims. And of course, in feudal Europe, it was the Catholic Church which played the role paralleled by the Orthodox Church in Ethiopia. The wealth of Ethiopia rested on an agricultural base. The fertile uplands supported cereal growing, and there was considerable livestock raising, including the rearing of horses. Craft skills were developed in a number of spears, and foreign craftsmen were encouraged. For instance, early in the 15th century, Turkish artisans settled in the country and made coats of mail and weapons for the Ethiopian army. Coptics from uh, Egypt were also introduced to help run the financial uh, administration.
no one denies that the word feudal can be applied to Ethiopia in those centuries because there existed a clear-cut class contradiction between the landlords and the peasants. Those relations grew out of communalism that had characterized Ethiopia much earlier, like other parts of Africa. Feudal Ethiopia included lands that were communally owned by village and ethnic communities, as well as lands belonging directly to the crown. But in addition, large territories were conferred by the conquering Amorite dynasties on members of the royal family, while soldiers and priests. Uh, those who received huge areas of land became Ras, or provincial priv uh, princess, and they had judges appointed by the emperor attached to them. The peasants in their domain were uh, reduced to tenants who could earn their living only by produ offering produce to the landlord and taxes to the state, also in produce. The landlords exempted themselves from tax, a typical situation in feudal societies, and one which fed the fires of revolution in Europe, wherein the bourgeois class grew powerful enough to challenge the fact that the feudalists were using political power to tax everyone but themselves. Ethiopia, of course, never reached that stage of transition to capitalism. What is clear is that the transition to feudalism had been made. Huh. Ethiopia, of course, never reached that stage of transition to capitalism. What is clear is that the transition to feudalism had been made. Now, that's an interesting statement. I'm going to have to marinate on that one. Let's talk about this Ethiopia section. He was, he was giving us some pretty good information here. So, right at the start, it says, Ethiopia here, too, at the start of, right at the start of its history as a great power was ruled over by foreigners. The kingdom of Aksum was one of the most important nuclei around which feudal Ethiopia eventually changed. Um, so it's already starting off with a context of the country uh, being ruled over by people who aren't even Ethiopian. Uh, after they had moved inland and participated in the development of the, of the Christian feudal Ethiopian state, referring to uh, the the founding of Axum that goes back to the first century. Uh, the Ethiopian, Tigrian, and Emirate ruling class was a proud one, he says, tracing its descent to Solomon as a state which incorporated several other smaller states and kingdoms. It was an empire in the same sense as feudal Austria or Prussia, which is definitely not anything that I ever um, heard about. And I sure as hell didn't know about this name, Conquering Lion of the tribe of Judah, elect of God, emperor, of Ethiopia king of kings in reference to the well the Ethiopian emperor that's not something that we hear about uh since he says this is important history to know because I think laymen who just hear stuff like mild killed landlords think that means like the kind of landlords in the US and not like feudal lords yeah that's a really good distinction to make between your modern day landlord and how their relationship works I mean it's still the same conceptualization of a coercion and exploitation but it exists under a liberal bourgeois state now where tenant rights did not you know even have their liberal form you know under feudalism the way we know them today so that's a really good point you brought up sensei yeah i know Fieldy, what a title conquering lion of the tribe of judah elect of god emperor of ethiopia king of kings based that's what we call that based obviously u.s landlords suck of course but you know Liberal bourgeois landlords and feudal lords who could literally um, force you to settle land that wasn't familiar to you just so that they can um, collect taxes on that land uh, vis-a-vis -vis what happened to um, a lot of Koreans when there was still just one Korea uh, is not at all the kind of thing that can happen to you today where Nobody can force you to take up a house that you don't want to live in just so they can tax you for living in said house. You know, the feudal uh, relation between the feudal lord and the peasant was even more brutal and pronounced than the tenant and the landlord relationship is under capitalism, which is saying something because that relationship is exploitative, especially when you talk about uh, the coming uh, the coming crisis uh, should, the, should the moratorium on evictions. Uh, ever be allowed to expire i think something right now something the, the statistic we have now is something along the lines of 550,000 houseless people 28 million under threat to be um houseless 
17 million um, unoccupied uh, homes in the States, something along those lines. So like this is, you know, relations haven't improved. They have just taken on a different conceptualization as the mode of production has developed. We have to always think of it along those lines. Uh, Lecter says, oh, I've heard it a ton before from the Christians and Rastafarians out here. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. It's a it's a hell of a title. That's one of the coolest titles I ever heard, not going to lie. And, and Eloquent says, U.S. landlords benefit greatly by the flattening of classes by capital to muddy class interests and solidarity. Oh, yeah. And oftentimes to get ourselves out of the so-called rat race that is created by the capitalists in the first place, one of the things they they try to do to tell you, oh, if you want to, uh, if you want to get yourself out of the rat race, you want to lift yourself up out of poverty, save up and own some property, become a landlord. That in stocks seems to be the liberal answer to how you know a marginalized person can get their hands on some money in order to be able to get themselves out of their situation. Because of course they necessarily make the question of lifting oneself out of poverty a question of how it comes down to the individual as opposed to questioning the person's relationship to the institutions at all. It's the whole, uh, you feed a houseless person and they call you a hero. You ask a person why they're houseless and they call you a communist. You know, this is kind of how um, the entire conceptualization of the so-called American dream works in the first place. And you can see it uh, take early conceptualization and, and how feudal and, uh, feudal relations work with peasants because it's the relationship we have today with landlords is necessarily born out of the old relation to feudal lords. Um, why the need for liberal so um, bourgeois tenant rights uh, was even needed is born out of how exploitative the relation to the old feudal lord was in the first place. So even though it's happening in Ethiopia and in other parts of Africa, um, the way those relations have developed across the world are connected and related, not at all disconnected, and certainly um, not having anything or not divorced from having anything to do with each other, have everything to do with each other. So that's something to bring up. The American dream of getting rich enough to exploit others instead of being the one exploited. Exactly, Cincy. So uh, let's move on to Nubia, uh, who was saying that they can do some reading. Uh, Comrade Bird, you want to do some reading? Appreciate you. Okay. Nubia was another Christian region in Africa, but one which is not so famous as Ethiopia. In the 6th century AD, Christianity was introduced into the Middle Nile and the districts once ruled by the famous state of Cush, or Meroe. In the period before the birth of Christ, Cush was a rival to Egypt in splendor, and it ruled Egypt for a number of years. Its decline in the 4th century AD was completed by attacks from the then expanding Axum. The three small Nubian states, which arose some time afterwards, were to some extent the heirs of Cush, although after their conversion to Christianity, it was this religion which dominated Nubian culture. The Nubian states, which had consolidated to two by about the 8th century, achieved most from the 9th to the 11th centuries in spite of great pressures from Arab and Islamic enemies, and they did not finally succumb until the 14th century. Scholarly interest in Nubia has focused on the ruins of large red brick churches and monasteries, which had murals and frescoes of fine quality. Several conclusions can be drawn from the material evidence. In the first place, a great deal of labor was required to build those churches, along with the stone fortifications which often surrounded them. As with the pyramids of Egypt or the feudal castles of Europe, the common builders were intensely exploited and probably coerced. Secondly, skilled labor was involved in the making of the bricks and in the architecture. The paintings indicate that the skills surpassed mere manual dexterity, and the same artistic merit is noticeable in fragments of painted pottery recovered from Nubia. It has already been indicated that the churches and monasteries played a major role in Ethiopia. And this is worth elaborating on with respect to Nubia, 
the monastery was a major unit of production. Numerous peasant huts were clustered around each monastery, which functioned very much as did the manor of a feudal lord. The wealth that accumulated inside the churches was alienated from the peasants, while the finest aspects of the non-material culture, such as books, were accessible only to a small minority. Not only were the peasants illiterate, but in many cases they were non-Christians or only nominally Christian, judging from the better known Ethiopian example of the same date. When the Christian ruling class of Nubia was eliminated by the Muslims, very little of the achievements of the old state remained in the fabric of the people's daily lives. Such reversals in the historian states were not in existence in the 15th century, but they constitute a legitimate example of the potentialities of African development. One can go further and discern that Kush was still contributing to African development long after the kingdom had declined and given way to Christian Nubia. It is clear that Kush was a center from which many positive cultural elements diffused to the rest of Africa. Brass work of striking similarity to that of Miro was reproduced in West Africa, and the technique by which West Africans cast their brass is generally held to have originated in Egypt and to have been passed on by way of Kush. Above all, Kush was one of the earliest and most vigorous centers of iron mining and smelting in Africa, and it was certainly one of the sources from which this crucial aspect of technology passed to the rest of the continent. That is why the Middle Nile was a leading force in the social, economic, and political development of Africa as a whole. Thank you for that, uh, Comrade Bird. So, uh, man, they was talking about a lot of good information in here, too. So, first off, I didn't know about Nubia being another Christian region. In Africa, so that's a uh, new information to me. Hell, I'll, I'll never really hear much about Nubia at all, truth be told. So it said, in the period before the birth of Christ, uh, Kush uh, was a rival to Egypt in splendor, and it ruled Egypt for a number of years. Its decline in the fourth century A.D. was completed by attacks from the then expanding Axum. You can already start to, um, you know, almost he is almost alluding to the early. Uh, onset of what would evolve to be what we think of as colonization or imperialism it sounds like he's describing there he says the three small nubian states which arose some time afterwards were to some extent the heirs of kush although after their conversion to christianity uh it was this religion which dominated nubian culture uh he said the nubian states which i consolidated to two by about the eighth century achieved most from the 9th to the 11th centuries in spite of great pressures from Arab and Islamic enemies. And they did not finally succumb until the 14th century. You know, when I read something like, quote, in spite of great pressures from Arab and Islamic enemies, I always think about that, especially when it comes to the word pressures. Because when I think about the word pressures and how it applies to one state, doing it to another state in this context i uh in that context i always think about it along the lines of doing shit like sanctions and other kinds of economic imperialism withholding finance capital from countries in order to put a halt to their development and something along those lines and it makes me wonder if the same sort of concept you know before there was even what we think of as capital uh was kind of going on you know against these nubian states if the if they were being denied resources, if they were having trade routes cut off, um, something, um, things along those lines. I wonder if that was, if that's what Rodney, Rodney was getting at with that, because that would, uh, that would, uh, that would make a lot of sense. So, Saber says obelisk. So he posts a picture of a uh, obelisk of Axum that looks really good shit, and then he says the legendary uh, kingdom of Kush with its capitals in what is now Northern Sudan, helped define the cultural and political landscape of Northeastern Africa for more than a thousand years. Kush was a part of Nubia, which stretched from the Upper Nile to the Red Sea. That's cool shit. Um, Comrade Burp said, There's, Christian monks were often the only literate people in an area, from what I've read, so they were gatekeepers of knowledge. Sounds like that was the case in Nubia. 
That's cool. Although Kush and Egypt consistently exchange culture, they maintain distinct identities. In Egyptian art, as in the tomb of Hoy above, Kushites are depicted with darker skin and a distinct cropped hairstyle. That's cool as shit. Uh, good for being here, Zebs. We'll see you next week, comrade. We'll get that video up for you so you can catch the rest. Saber says, Kush and Egypt were perhaps most unified during the intermediate period when Egypt controlled Kush and during the 25th dynasty when Kushite pharaohs ruled Egypt. Taraka, above, was probably the most influential of these pharaohs. That's cool as shit. Gotta pin this. Uh, that's, that's cool as hell. Thank you, Saber. Yeah, so what other, what other information was, uh, was here? In the first place, a great deal of labor was required to build the churches along with the stone fortifications that surrounded them. And as with the pyramids of Egypt or the feudal castles of Europe, the common builders were uh, intensely exploited and probably coerced. Uh, man, that's cool as shit. That picture Saber posted it, isn't it, y'all? Secondly, skilled labor was involved in the making of the uh, bricks and the, uh, architecture. Uh, the paintings indicate that the skills surpassed uh, mere manual dexterity and the same artistic merit is noticeable in fragments of painted poverty, uh, po poverty, pottery recovered from Nubia. Uh, so we had quite the architectural culture in uh, Nubia at this time. Um, lots of skilled labor going into architecture, which, you know, given what we have come to learn, makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, it has already been indicated that the church and monasteries played a major role in Ethiopia, and this is worth elaborating on with respect to Nubia. The monastery was a major unit of production. Numerous peasant huts were clustered around each monastery, which functioned very much like the manner of a feudal lord. The wealth that accumulated inside the churches was alienated from the peasants, while the finest aspects of the non-material culture, such as books, were accessible only to a small minority. So... That's interesting. He says the numerous peasant hunts were clustered around each monastery, which functioned very much like the manner of a feudal lord. So this was a holding for uh, religious leaders and other such uh, people of high uh, status in society at that time. And of course, the same exploitative and coercive relationship between laborer and feudal lord exists because we're talking about the wealth being accumulated, being alienated from the peasants and the uh, and books only being accessible to a small minority which to the extent that we know these ter these terms today we would think of uh the equivalent of the bourgeoisie being the kind of people who have access to the information since we already know uh how detrimental it is to peasants and other ruling class figures uh, uh, it's, uh, it's already how detrimental it is for peasants to read books from the perspective of work uh feudal figures religious figures etc they've always tried to make sure that we can't get our hands on books in order to um, understand our colonial situation and get ourselves out from under it uh, so that's good shit that uh, Comrade Burb is reading there uh, Saber says the final period of the kingdom of Kush and he's quoting is sometimes known as the Marietic period after its capital at, at Moreau the most significant and striking artifacts of Marietic culture are probably its pyramids Marietic pyramids, smaller and steeper, and their older Egyptian cousins are today a UNESCO World Heritage Site. That's cool as hell. Jesus. <laughs> That's cool as shit. We gotta, uh, I gotta make sure to post these images on the, uh, video when we upload this section later so, like, other people can enjoy them if they don't happen to be here. Uh, Comrade Burp says, the way history is taught in the U.S. is imperialist gatekeeping keeping and manipulative narrative. No, one of the reasons it's important to read works like this is so that we can understand how rich and um, creative and innovative some of these cultures were. Like, just, I don't, I never associated Nubia with being a rich architectural culture, you know, full of builders. But what he's saying in here and putting it in, you know, pretty blatant terms, it's like pretty obvious that's what it was and actually not surprising at all fire architecture all right Ildi says not only taught incorrectly but i think intentionally made boring so we're taught as kids not want to look further into it i can read uh Fildy's gonna read it's all good thank you Fildy. all right there you go the maghreb 
Islam was the great revealed religion which played the major role in the period of the feudal development of the Maghreb, the lands of the western extremity of the Islamic empires that stretched across Africa, Asia, and Europe within years of the Prophet Muhammad's death in the 7th century of the Christian era. The Arab empire building under the banner of Islam is a classic example of the role of religion in that respect. Ibn Khaldun, a great 14th century North African historian, was of the opinion that Islam was the most important force allowing the Arabs to transcend the narrow boundaries of small family communities, which were constantly struggling among each other. He wrote, Arab pride, touchiness, and intense jealousy of power render it impossible for them to agree. Only when their nature has been permeated by religious impulse are they transformed so that the tendency to anarchy is replaced by a spirit of mutual defense. Consider the moment when religion dominated their policy and led them to, to observe a religious law designed to promote the moral and material interests of civilization. Under a series of successors to the Prophet Muhammad, how vast their empire became and how strongly was it established. The above remarks by Ibn Khaldun cover only one aspect of Arab imperial expansion, but it was certainly a crucial one and attested to the essential role of ideology in the developmental process. That has to be considered in relation to and in addition to the material circumstances. Furthermore, in judging the material conditions at any given time, which might form the basis for further expansion of production and further growth of society's power, it is also necessary to consider the historical legacy. Like Islamic Egypt and Christian Nubia, the Maghreb of the Islamic dynasties inherited a rich historical and cultural tradition. It was the seat of the famous society of Carthage, which flourished between 1200 BC and 200 BC, and which was a blend of foreign influences from the Eastern Mediterranean and the Berber peoples of the Maghreb. The region had subsequently been an important section of the Roman and Byzantine empires. And before becoming Muslim, the Maghreb had actually distinguished itself as a center of non-conformist Christ Christianity, which went under the name of Donatism. The striking achievements of Muslim Maghreb were spread over the naval, military, commercial, and cultural spheres. Its navies controlled the Western Mediterranean and its armies took over most of Portugal and Spain. When the Muslim advance into Europe was turned back in the year 732 AD, North African armies were already deep into France. In the 11th century, the armies of the Almoravid dynasty gathered strength from deep within Senegal in Mauritania and launched themselves across the Strait of Gibraltar to reinforce Islam in Spain, which was being threatened by Christian kings. For over a century, the Almoravid rule in North Africa and Iberia was characterized by commercial wealth and a resplendent literary and architectural record. After being ejected from Spain in the 1230s, the Maghreb Muslims, or Moors as they were called, continued to maintain a dynamic society on African soil. As one index to the standard of social life, it has been pointed out that public baths were common in the cities of Maghreb at a time when in Oxford the doctrine was still being propounded that the washing of the body was a dangerous act. One of the most instructive aspects of the history of the Maghreb is the interaction of social formations to produce this state, produce the state. A major problem that has to be resolved was that of integrating the isolated Berber groups into larger political communities. There were also contradictions between sedentary groups and nomadic pastoral sectors of populations. The Berbers were mainly pastoralists organized in patriarchal clans and in groups of clans and in, uh, and in groups of clans connected by a democratic council of all adult males. Grazing land was under communal ownership and maintaining irrigation was also a collective responsibility for the agriculturalists. 
yet cooperation within kin groups contrasted with hostility between those who had no immediate blood ties. And it was only in the face of the Arab invaders that the Berbers united, using a nonconformist uh, Karajayat Islam as their ideology. The Karajayat revolt of 739 AD is considered in one sense as being nationalistic and in another sense a revolt of the exploited classes against the Arab military bureaucratic and theocratic elite who professed the orthodox Sunni Islam. That revolt of the Berber masses laid the basis for Moroccan nationalism, and three centuries later, the Almohad dynasty from 1147 to 1270 brought political unity to the whole of Maghreb as a product of the synthesis of Berber and Arab achievements in the sphere of state building. Unfortunately, the Maghreb nation did not last, and instead the region was bequeathed the nuclei, nuclei of three nation states, Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia. Within each of the three areas, divisive tendencies were very strong in the 14th and 15th centuries. For instance, in Tunisia, the ruling Hafsid dynasty was constantly involved in crushing local rebellions and defending the integrity of the state. It has been noted already that the political state in Africa and elsewhere was a consequence of development of the productive forces, but the state in turn also conditioned the rate at which the economy advanced because the two were dialectically interrelated. Therefore, the failure of the Maghreb to build a nation state and the difficulties of consolidating state power, even within the three divisions of Morocco, Algeria, and Tunisia, were factors holding back the further development of the region. Moreover, political division weakened the Maghreb vis-a-vis -vis foreign enemies, and Europe was soon to take advantage of those internal weaknesses by launching attacks from the year 1415 onwards. The experience of the Maghreb could be drawn upon to illustrate the lengthy nature of transition from the one mode of production to another, and the fact that two different ways of organizing society could coexist side by side over centuries. Throughout the period under discussion, a great deal of land in that part of Africa retained its communal ownership and family labor. Meanwhile, considerable socioeconomic stratification had taken place and antagonistic classes had emerged. At the very bottom of the ladder were the slaves or Herentine, who were most often black Africans from south of the Sahara. Then came the Akham or landless peasants who worked the proprietor's land and gave the latter four fifths of whatever was produced. Special mention should be made of the position of women who were not a class by themselves, but who suffered from deprivations of the hands of their own menfolk and of the male-controlled ruling class. Therefore, the women in the Akam class were in a very depressed condition. At the top of the society were the big landowners who wielded political power, along with other devotees of the Muslim religion. None of the African societies discussed so far can be said to have thrown up capitalist forms to the point where the accumulation of capital became the principal motive force. However, they all had flourishing commercial sectors, money lenders, and strong handicraft industries, which were the features which ultimately gave birth to modern capitalism through evolution and revolution. The Maghreb merchants were quite wealthy. They gained from the energies of the cultivators, cattlemen, and shepherds. They indirectly or directly mobilized the labor in the mines of copper, lead, antimony, and irony, uh, and iron, um, and they appropriated surplus from the skills of the craftsmen making textiles, carpets, leather, pottery, and articles of brass and iron. The merchants were a class of accumulators, and their dynamism made itself felt not only in the Maghreb, but also in the Sahara and across the Sahara in West Africa. In that way, the development of the Maghreb acted as a factor in the development of what was called the Western Sudan. Uh, thank you, Fieldy. That was that was good shit. So, one of the um, there's a lot to talk about here. So let's let's talk about it. Uh, so, first and foremost, Nightcap made in the chat said 
I tell a lot of people that Africans were the ones that taught Europeans how to bathe and helped them usher in the re Renaissance and taught them not to sleep with their livestock and built castles, bridges, and underground waterways in European countries. Exactly. When we, when we talk about like the world, you know, has in a lot of ways developed along an African context based on practices found in Africa. Like that's not, that's not hyperbole. Uh, I mean, Rodney's quite literally laying out with examples here in how Europe underdeveloped Africa, how different cultural practices from the way we raise livestock to the way we even go about building in the first place to the land that we decide to build on, you know, where techniques and processes that they learned, you know, from, um, from Africa and other people that, uh, that they colonized. Uh, like there's a reason people say that like Europeans don't have their own culture. And that's because, well, in a very real material sense, they, at the very least, uh, those who went on to be white Americans don't really have a culture of their own because their culture is quite literally stealing culture from other people's, stealing techniques from other people. And yeah, hot take, but that's what it is to be uh, white in America. So, Saber Post, The Dawning of the Apocalypse, Gerald Horn. There were good reasons to flee London in the 16th century. Many infants died because of the ins, uh, the insalubriness of urban life. If an indigene from North America had visited a typical town across the Atlantic, he or she would have been stunned by the proliferation of pollutants and the dearth of personal hygiene. Uh, Actually, the search for perfumes in Asia to deodorize this nostril wrinkling problem led directly to navigation feats and colonialism itself. This century, smallpox, chlora, plague, and worse were generally diseases unknown in the pre Sikhs invaded by the English and their allies in America. Along with the horrid unsanitariness that rampaged in crowded cities on the northeast bank of the Atlantic. Man, I had never thought about it along those lines, Saber, but yeah, dig it. Like, I've known that the diseases and some of the other things that they introduced to kill us weren't necessarily found in our, uh, in regions that they were taking coerced labor and slaves from, but I didn't think of it along the lines of c colonialism itself, but the very act of spreading those plagues would very much be something that we would count as colonial well, colonialism or imperialism. So that's a really strong point, comrade. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, so let's read. Let's go back a little bit into the section on the um, grab that uh, that Fieldy was reading. They read quite a bit there. So what was uh, what was that point that had jumped out at me? Right there. So like Islamic Egypt and. Um, Christian Nubia, the Maghreb of the Islamic dynasties inherited a rich historical and cultural tradition. It was the seat of the famous society of Carthage, uh, or, of, or of Carthage, which flourished between 1200 BC and 200 BC, and which was a blend of foreign influences from the Eastern Mediterranean with the Berber peoples of the Maghreb. The region has subsequently been an important section of the Roman and Byzantine empires. And before becoming Muslim, the Maghreb had actually distinguished itself as a center of nonconformist Christianity, which went under the name of Donatism. Never heard of Donatism before, so that's interesting. The striking achievements of Muslim Maghreb were spread over the naval, military, commercial, and cultural spheres. And this is the part that jumped out. Its navies controlled the Western Mediterranean, and its armies took over most of Portugal and Spain. When the Muslim advance into Europe was turned back in the year 732 AD, North African armies were already deep into France. Definitely didn't know that. In the 11th century, the armies of the Almoravi dynasty gathered strength from deep within Senegal and Mauritania and launched themselves against the strike of um, Gribal Altar to reinforce Islam in Spain, which was being threatened by Christian kings. For over a century, the Almoravi um, rule in North Africa and Iberia was characterized by commercial wealth and a resplendent literary and architectural record. After being ejected from the Spain in the nineteen in the twelve thirties, the Maghreb Muslims or Moors, as they were called, continued to maintain a dynamic society on African soil. 
As one index to the standard of social life, it has been pointed out that public baths were common in the cities of Maghreb. At a time when in Oxford, the doctrine was still being propounded that the washing of the body was a dangerous act. So, what's like jumping out at me and why that section resonated particularly that uh, Fieldy read was that, so they're talking about advance into these different, you know, European territories. Uh, especially uh, in the context of having started from North Africa. But the, typically the way any kind of so-called um, exploits of um, North African Muslims is talked about when we learn it in history is that they were invaders and they were beat back by the victimized Europeans. That's This is the way that it's taught is it's in the schools but what we have here is a presentation that to the extent they were pushing into france and portugal etc they themselves were responding uh to col to colonization and colonialism that the uh that the european powers were trying to perpetrate uh against them so it's it's, it's not even here presented as this oh they're just trying to colonize it's more so as a logical totally expected and self-determined act of you know response against the european um doctrine of colonial colonization and, and domination of the whole world and put along those like it's still as brutal as you would expect any push into another country to be but it takes on the context of not being offensive in nature but you know some um, somewhat defensive, so that's never a perspective ever uh, ever pushed in the in the in these European institutions that we call that we call you know the modern day education system. That's for sure. So, what is else? What is being said in the chat? So Saber says, or better yet, uh, Night Cat Mate says the common cold came from the fact that they were sleeping with horses. Uh, could you could you expand on that or like show us something to read about that one um, nightcap? I sure as hell never read that. So Cameron says, in addition to it to this, throughout 750 AD to around 900 AD, almost all scientific development in Europe came from translating Islamic texts from Africa. Uh, Cedric uh, Robinson writes about this a lot in Black Marxism. Okay, well. Add black mark add black Marxism to the list of things that need to be read and hear ASAP, probably on a, definitely on a Monday when we can do a black Marxist text. Uh Saber says Sniffing wealth Englishmen were flocking to Iberia too, which brought them into closer contact with Africa and the fortunes to be made there. As early as the eighth century and continuing thereafter, Muslims Pre-1492, rulers of a good deal of Iberia commanded the mightiest gold reserves with thousands of miles, with Africa being the source, um, which then provided strength in the Mediterranean, the peninsula, and what was what has been called the Near East. As more African gold began to pour into Europe via the peninsula, increased trade resulted continentally um, to the point that by the early 1100s, the Bay of Biscay was turned to the Sea, the sea of English. And English uh, pirates were detained in Galicia. Coincidentally, the first recorded commercial treaty between Portugal and England was signed in 1294, binding London to the peninsula and allowing England not only to capitalize upon Lisbon's subsequent um, per emulations, but also to counter Madrid's um, thrust into Ireland by backing the Portuguese against the Spaniards. Of course, Portugal and Spain often backed different sides during the frequent conflicts between England and France. A crucial shaper of the balance of power continentally with lethal implications for uh, Africa and the Americas. For this 13th century trend began to assert itself. Several of the West African coastal peoples had quite advanced civilizations, though their trade connections uh, were with the interior, not the ocean that evolved uh, subsequently. East Africa long had been linked to a wider world via the maritime superhighway known as the Indian Ocean. Well, damn. 
Talk about a fucking history lesson. Thank you, Saber. Erlistart says, I think it's really weird how Europeans go from the Roman Greek era of low to public baths to thinking it's a bad idea to bathe. I'm curious about what caused that. Yeah, we got to definitely do some research into that because it, it, uh, it's becoming a theme of European cultures not being into bathing as we see it. And I mean, hell, I, now that I think of it, growing up, I used to hear... Uh, <laughs> I used to hear jokes coming up all the time whenever I want to go stay at any of my white friends' homes for like a sleepover as a kid. Uh, grandma or mom being like, be careful because you know white people don't bathe. And I'm like, I never knew where that came from. But like the more I learn about colonization and like Europe's interactions with other uh, marginalized countries due to colonization or colonization, this shit continues to come up. The idea that like Europeans don't fucking bathe. So like, if the more European among you have any explanation or context on that, for the love of God, please share. Because I, inquiring comrades, need to know. <laughs> White people, please bathe. My sensory issues beg you. <laughs> like, what the actual fuck? Take a fucking bath. Like, modern showers are a thing. You can just do it. You can even do it for free. You can literally go to a fucking uh, uh, Planet Fitness and they will let you shower for nothing. You know, just please. All right, what we got next? Uh, what was the other part? Oh, yeah, so the rearing of horses, mules, and donkeys was also carried on, which was made possible by white, tetsi, free areas. To add further variety, the Great Niger River allowed for the rise of specialist fishermen. Population the dispensable factor of production could only have reached the density which it did because of increasing food supplies. While handicraft industry and trade sprang primarily from the products of agriculture, cotton cultivation led to the making of cotton cloth with such a variety of specialization that there was an internal that there was internal trade in particular cotton cloths, such as the unbleached fabric of Fuda Jalan and the blue cloth of uh, Gent. Pastoralism provided a variety of products for manufacture, notably cattle hides and goat skins, which went into the making of sandals, leather jackets for military use, leather pouches for amulets, and so on. Horses served as a means of transport to the, to the ruling class and made a major contribution to warfare and the size of the state. For the purposes of interbreeding, some horses were imported from North Africa, where the Arab bloodstock was of the finest quality. For pack transport, the donkey was, of course, better fitted. And the Mosi kingdom of Upper Volta for a long time specialized in breeding those pack animals, which were associated with long-distance trade, trade with the vast region. On the edge of the Sahara, the Kremo took over another technological asset introduced from the north. So that was interesting to me because I had never really contextualized, like, well, quite literally horses as being something that could be leveraged uh, under the old um, way of things in order to further develop it in your own country, being able to use horses and donkeys and mules and whatnot as a trading piece in order to be able to get material resources that would necessarily further the development of your own country and, and, and your own region uh, is, again, not something we are taught Africans were ever engaged in, but quite literally, it makes sense that they were. Uh, horses were needing to be imported from North Africa where the Arab blood stock was the finest quality, according to uh, Walter Rodney's saying here. So that's an interesting thing to think about. <laughs> Phil, he says they're going to shower as soon as they, she's going to shower as soon as she gets off the call. Yeah. I like showered right before this, and I might literally shower right afterwards, just in case I have to go be around white people anytime soon. So, you know. Uh, if you are able-bodied and don't do that stuff, it's a way of showing you aren't affected by the societal double standards. Uh, actually, Saber, did you have time to read, comrade? Yeah, I can read this this section. Cool, thank you. Cool. All right, before we go, I, I want to read one more one more quote that I found. That's oh yeah, yeah. What is it? Pretty pretty useful. Kind of it kind of adds on to what uh what was being said before about um various entities coming into uh to attack uh African societies. And how, how, how and how that sort of played out. So here's here's a quote. I'll, I'll read it out. Cool. Um, post it too. 
Oh, there yeah. you go. Yeah. All right. The uh, the site was North Central Africa. Morocco, yet another predominantly Islamic nation, courted by London, had invaded with England's assistance the once mighty Songhai Empire. This proved to be a double disaster, with both Victor and Vanquish a weaker, a boon to an ascending quote unquote Christian, if not Protestant Europe. By destroying the strongest centralized state in sub Saharan Africa, the Moroccan conquest did irreparable harm to the trans Saharan roots that had enrich, enriched uh, both Morocco and West Africa. And this instability radiated to the aptly and unfortunately named Gold and Slave Coast of Africa, indicative of what was soon to be plundered excessively on the uh, Besset continent. Morocco's force of 5,000 was bolstered by uh, Moriscos. Muslims expelled from Spain, and mercenaries as they proceeded to Gao on the Niger River. Over 80,000 fighters with mere lances and javelins were mowed down systematically by weapons, um, an outgrowth of the aforementioned, quote, military revolution, unquote. In a sad coda to a bygone era and the commencement of a newer one, they reportedly cried as they fell, Quote, we are Muslims, we are your brothers in religion, end quote. Apparently unaware that this newer era was in the long run to sideline religion in favor of conquest and commerce and capitalism. Uh, Moroccans had been armed with English mus uh, muskets in return for salt, uh, Peter for ammunition, then soon wielded, uh, wielded in the, what was to be called Virginia in the early 17th century. The Moroccan envoy in London was quite close to Anthony Radcliffe, uh, residing at his home for six months at one point. The latter's daughter, Anne, was a benefactor of what became Harvard University, which once housed a woman's uh, college named in her honor, continuing the uh, resonance uh, says from the 16th century. Relations between England and Morocco were so close, uh, perhaps a key to understanding Shakespeare's Othello, for example, uh, that less than a uh, decade after the transformative, uh, transformative 19, uh, sorry, 1591 vanquishing of the Songhai Empire, the two powers were huddling and discussing a joint invasion of their mutual foe, Spain, then followed by a joint ouster of the Spaniards from the Caribbean. So that's the, that's the, 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 last, the last part of the quote. Let me, let me uh, paste that as well. But yeah, kind of highlights... The, the impacts of uh, of collaborations between uh, Europe and uh, Africa, uh, namely Morocco in this case, and how it sort of destabilized the entire region um, because of the pre-existing trade routes and stuff like that. So, okay, let's... Mm -hmm. uh, oh, that's good shit. Uh, we gotta, uh, when I post this, I'm gonna make sure to uh, tie, to like put the, the time link um, with the... Uh, quote so that people can follow along with you too so people know what you were reading that's going to be very important context so i appreciate you sharing cool 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 all right i will read uh the western sudan to the arabs the whole of africa south of the sahara was the bilad as sudan the land of the blacks the name survives today only in the republic of sudan on the nile but references to the western sudan in early times concerned the zone presently occupied by senegal Mali, Upper Volta, and Niger, plus parts of Mauritania, Guinea, and Nigeria. The Western Sudanic empires of Ghana, Mali, and Songhai have become bywords in the struggle to illustrate the achievements on the African past. That is the area to which African nationalists and progressive whites point when they want to prove that Africans too were capable of political, administrative, and military greatness in the epoch before the white men. However, the people's demands at any given time change the kinds of questions to which historians are expected to provide answers. Today, the masses of Africa seek quote-unquote development and total emancipation. The issues that need resolution with regard to Western Sudanic history are those which illuminate the principles underlying the impressive development of certain states in the heart of Africa. The origins of the Empire of Ghana go back to the 5th century AD, but it reached its peak between the 9th and 11th century. Mali had its rhyme in the 13th and 14th centuries, and Songhai in the two subsequent centuries. None of the three 
were in exactly the same location, and the ethnic origin of the three ruling classes was different, but they should be regarded as, quote, successor states, unquote, following essentially the same line of evolution and growth. They have been called trading states so often that it is almost forgotten that the principal activity of the population was agriculture. It was a zone in which several species of millet were domesticated, along with a species of rice, several other food plants, and at least one type of cotton. It was a zone which saw the relatively early introduction of iron in the millennium before the birth of Christ, and iron tools exercised their attendant benefits on agriculture. The open savanna country of the Western Sudan also favoured livestock. Some of the groups, such as the Fulani, were exclusively pastoralist, but livestock was to be found in varying degrees throughout the huge region. Cattle were the most significant domesticated animals, followed by goats. The rearing of horses, mules and donkeys was also carried on, which was made possible by wide tsetse free areas. To add further variety, the Great Niger River allowed for the rise of specialist fishermen. Population, the indispensable factor of production, could only have reached the density which it did because of increasing food supplies, while handicraft, industry and trade sprang primarily from the products of agriculture. Cotton cultivation led to the making of cotton cloth, with such a variety of specialisation that there was internal trade in a particular cotton cloth, such as the unbleached fabric of Futur Jalon and the blue cloth of Jenny. Pastoralism provided a variety of products for manufacture, notably cattle hides and goat skins, which went into the making of sandals, leather jackets for military use, leather pouches for amulets and so on. Horses served as a means of transport to the ruling class and made a major contribution to warfare and the size of the state. For the purposes of interbreeding, some horses were imported from North Africa, where the Arab bloodstock was of the finest quality. For pack transport, the donkey was of course better fitted, and the Mossai kingdom of Upper Volta for a long time specialised in breeding those pack animals, which were associated with long distance trade within the vast region. On the edge of the Sahara, the camel took over another technological asset introduced from the north. Mining was a sphere in which production was important. Some of the royal clans in the Western Sudan, such as that of the Kanti, were specialist uh, blacksmiths. In a period of expansion by warfare, the control over iron supplies and over iron working skills was obviously decisive. Besides, the two most important articles of long distance trade were salt and gold both obtained principally by mining. Neither the salt supplies nor the gold supplies were originally within the domains of Ghana, but it took steps to integrate them either by trade or by territorial expansion. Ghana struck north into the Sahara and towards the very end of the 10th century, it captured the town of Aldegast from the Berbers, a town useful for the control of the incoming salt mined in the middle of the desert. Similarly, Mali and Songhai sought the control of Tagaza, which was the largest single centre of salt mining. Songhai took the prize of Tagaza from the desert Berbers and held it for many years in the face of opposition from Morocco. Another crucial but seldom stressed element in the pattern of production was the ownership of copper mines in the Sahara by both Mali and Songhai. To the south of Ghana lay the important sources of gold on the upper Senegal and its tributary the Felem. It is said that Ghana obtained its gold by quote unquote silent or quote unquote dumb barter, which was described as follows. The merchants beat great drums to summon the local natives, who were naked and lived in holes in the ground. From these holes, which were doubtless the pits from which they dug the gold, they refused to emerge in the presence of the foreign merchants. The latter, therefore, used to arrange their trade goods in piles on the riverbank and retire out of sight. The local natives then came and placed a heap of gold beside each pile and withdrew. If the merchants were satisfied, they took the gold and retreated, beating their drum to signify that the market was over. The writer of the above lines, E.W. Beauville, a supposed European authority on the Western Sudan, then goes on to say that silent trade, or dumb barter, was a feature of the Western Sudan's gold uh, trade throughout all the centuries until modern times. Actually, the only dumb thing about the trade is what he writes about it. 
the story of the Ambata for gold in West Africa is repeated in several accounts, starting with ancient Greek scripts. It is clearly a rough approximation of the first attempts at exchange of a people coming into contact with strangers, and it was not a permanent procedure. During the rule of Ghana, the people of the two principal gold fields of Bambuk and Bure were drawn into regular trade relations with the Western Sudan. Ghana probably and Mali certainly exercised political rule over the two regions, where the mining and distribution of gold became a very complicated process. During the centuries of Mali's greatness, extensive mining of gold began in the forests of modern Ghana to supply the trans-Saharan gold trade. The existing social systems expanded and strong states emerged to deal with the sale of gold. The merchants who came from the great cities of the Western Sudan had to buy the gold by weight using a small accurate measurement known as the benda. When the Portuguese arrived at the river Gambia and got a glimpse at how gold was traded on the upper reaches of the river, they marvelled at the dexterity shown by the Mandinga merchants. The latter carried very finely balanced scales inlaid with silver and suspended from cords of twisted silk. The gold dust and nuggets were weighted with brass weights. The expertise of the Mandinga in measuring gold and in other forms of commerce was largely due to the fact that within that ethnic group, there was a core of professional traders, commonly referred to as the Diulas. They were not very wealthy, but were distinguished by their willingness to travel thousands of miles from one end of the Western Sudan to another. They also reached the coast, or very near to the coast, in Gambia, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Ivory Coast, and Ghana. The Diulas handled a long list of African products, sold from the Atlantic coast and the Sahara. Cola nuts from the forests of Liberia and Ivory Coast, gold from Akan country in modern Ghana, leather from Husaland, dried fish from the coast, cotton cloth from many districts and especially from the central arcas of the Western Sudan, iron from Futa Jalan in modern Guinea, shea butter from the Upper Gambia and a host of other local articles. In addition, the trade of Western Sudan involved the circulation of goods originating in North Africa, notably fabrics from Egypt and the Maghreb, and coral beads from Keuta on the Mediterranean coast. Therefore, the pattern of Western Sudanic and Trans-Saharan commerce was integrating the resources of a wider area stretching from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic Ocean. Long-distance trade across the Sahara had special characteristics. Some scholars have spoken of the camel as the ship of the Sahara and the towns which the camel caravans entered on either side of the desert were called quote-unquote ports. In practice, the Trans-Saharan trade was as great an achievement as crossing an ocean. Much more than local trade, it stimulated the famous cities of the region such as Walata, Timbuktu, Gao and Jene. And it brought in the literate Islamic culture. Long distance trade strengthened state power, which meant in effect the power of the lineages who transformed themselves into a permanent aristocracy. However, it is a gross oversimplification of cause and effect to say that it was the Trans-Saharan trade which built the Western Sudanic empires. Ghana, Mali and Songhai grew out of their environment and out of their efforts of their own population, and it was only after they had a certain status that their ruling classes could express an interest in long distance trade and could provide the security to permit that trade to flourish. It is significant that the Western Sudan never provided any significant capital for the Trans-Saharan trade. The capital came from the merchants of Fez, Telemken and other cities of the Maghreb, and they sent their agents to reside in, rest in the Western Sudan. To some extent, it was a colonial relationship because the exchange was unequal in North Africa's favour. However, the gold trade was at least capable of stimulating the development of the productive forces within West Africa, while the accompanying trade in slaves had no such benefits. Ghana, Mali and Songhai all exported small numbers of slaves, and the empire of Kanem Bonu gave slave exports a much higher priority because it controlled no gold supplies. Kanem Bonu used its power to raise for captives to the south as far as Adamawa, in modern Cameroons. The negative implications of such policies were to be fully brought out in later centuries, 
when a steady trickle of slaves from a few parts of West Africa across the Sahara was joined by massive flows of the continent's peoples towards destinations named by Europeans. Though falling considerably short of the feudal stage, state formation was more advanced in Western Sudan than in most other parts of Africa in the period 500 AD to 1500 AD. Apart from Ghana, Mali, Songhai and Kanembonu, there were outstanding kingdoms in Husaland, in Mosai, in Senegal, in the Futa Jalon Mountains of Guinea and in the basin of the Benue tributary of the River Niger. The Western Sudanic techniques of political organisation and administration spread out to many neighbouring regions and influenced the rise of innumerable small states scattered throughout the coastal region from the River Senegal to the Cameroon Mountains. Some specific Sudanic features were discernible in many kingdoms, notably the position of queen mother in the political structure. The strengths and weaknesses of the Sudanic states attest to the point which they had reached on the long road away from communalism, with respect to social relations and to the level of production. The state held together several clashing social formations and ethnic groups. In the case of Kanembonu, pastoralists and cultivators were even able to integrate the camel nomads of the desert. Elsewhere, the Tureg nomads were kept at bay so that cultivators and other sedentary peoples could live their lives in peace. Men, domestic beasts and goods were free to move for thousands of miles in security. However, the state had not yet broken down the barriers between different social formations. The state existed as an institution which collected tribute from the various communities and restrained them from clashing. In the periods of weakness, the superstructure of the state almost disappeared and left free scope for divisive political and social tendencies. Each successive great state was a further experiment to deal with the problem of unity, sometimes on a conscious level and more often as an unconscious byproduct of the struggle for survival. Under feudalism, the ruling class in the state for the first time tore away the social institutions which prevented the first embryo states from exercising direct action on each subject. That is to say, feudalism brought about a series of direct obligatory ties between the landed rulers and the landless subjects. In the Western Sudan, that clear-cut class division had not come into existence. By the time of Mali's uh, preeminence in the 13th or 14th century, a small amount of local slavery had come into existence, and by the 15th century, they were both chattel and domestic slaves, comparable to feudal serfs. For instance, in Senegal, the Portuguese traders found that there were elements in the population who worked most days for their masters, and a few days per month for themselves, a budding feudalist tendency. Nevertheless, most of the population still had ample access to land through their kin, and in political terms, that means that the authority of the ruling class was exercised over the head of families and clans rather than over each subject. Although communal egalitarianism was on its way out, communal relations still persisted and had by the 15th century become a break on the development of the Western Sudan. Such surplus as was being produced by the society over and above subsistence needs came out of tribute from the collective communities rather than directly from producer to the exploiting classes. That gave an incentive for maintaining the old social structures. Although they were incapable of increasing labour mobilisation and specialisation to a much greater degree. It was unlikely that there would be a violent social revolution because classes were not yet formed to spearhead a revolution. Under those circumstances, major advances of technology were required to spark off further changes. The degree of economic integration had to be enhanced by greater productivity in various areas, allowing for more trade, more specialisation in the division of labour and the possibility of surplus accumulation. But wheeled vehicles and the plough stopped in North Africa, and so too did uh, large-scale irrigation. Indeed, through the critical absence of large-scale irrigation, the productive base in the Western Sudan actually decreased, for the Sahara was advancing. Ghana had still done fertile agricultural land, but both Mali and Songhai had their centres further south, because the former northern terrain of Ghana was claimed by the Sahara through desiccation. Techniques necessary for the control of this hostile environment and for the increase of agriculture and manufacturing capacity had either to evolve locally or to be brought in from outside. In the next phase, of African history after the coming of the white men, 
both of those alternatives were virtually ruled out in West Africa. What was some of your thoughts on which we're reading, though, comrade? Uh, it's clear that uh, these societies were like far more complicated than most people give them credit for. Um, and, you know, even, even in situations where, uh, as, as was stated, they primarily use, utilize like uh, certain animals based on their based on their features and uh like you know for various reasons some for like travel purposes some for like uh you know agricultural purposes stuff like that um so obviously in a situation like that prioritizing wheels for travel especially when you're talking about uh like grasslands and some desert areas and going in and out of trees and stuff like that like having vehicles like that doesn't really it doesn't really make sense when you have when you already have access to animals that can fulfill those, those needs as well and maintaining a good uh sustainable like uh ecosystem as well so yeah so like just because those elements for instance that 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 people will typically associate as being like a feudal society, like having like wagons everywhere and stuff like that. Obviously there were wheels, you know what I mean? There, there were obviously wheels there as well, but like they weren't as predominant as they were in places that have more flatland and more like, uh, that may have a slightly different environment, for example. So that was a good observation that I kind of, that, that I appreciate from here. Um, there was one other thing too. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Another thing too was how, was how he kind of mentions all of the different um the different commodities or I don't even, I don't even know if they, they would be commodities at this time, but uh like different products, stuff like that, that were being um produced or cultivated somehow and then like transported thousands of miles across the uh, across that that particular region. And you have like very sophisticated ways of mediating between prices and weights and stuff like that. Um and that is yeah something that's like very very advanced and in order to keep that going for like centuries at a time maybe 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 longer you know requires a great deal of uh organization at some level um and as he was mentioning some places had levels of, of organization some were more like feudal some were more like communal um but uh yeah it's just really interesting to, to to look into it, and especially I'll try and find some pictures of the actual empires themselves because it's like they produce some like amazing architecture and sculptures and stuff like that and buildings. Um, so, so yeah, I'll try and find those. Sounds good. Yeah, we uh, let's see what was that section at. Here it is. So, one of the things that jumped out. However, the state had not yet broken down the barriers between different social formations. The state existed as an institution which collected tribute from the various communities and restrained them from clashing. In periods of weakness, the superstructure of the state almost disappeared and left uh, free scope for divisive political and social tendencies. Each successive great state was a further experiment to deal with a problem of unity, sometimes on a conscious level and more often as an unconscious byproduct of the struggle for survival. Uh, under feudalism, the ruling class and the state for the first time tore away the social institutions, which prevented the first embryo states from exercising direct action on each subject. That is to say, feudalism brought about a series of direct oblig obligatory ties between the landed rulers and the landless subjects in the western sudan that clear-cut class division had not come into existence by the time of mali's pre uh, preeminence in the 14th and 13th centuries a small amount of local slavery had come into existence and by the end of the 15th century there were both chattel slaves and domestic slaves comparable to feudal serfs so i find it really interesting how things developed in, in, from a certain context because what um they established in previous chapters was this like relationship that existed, for example, between uh, uh, a father and the uh, and the what we would think of as the son-in-law. How uh, by marrying his uh, daughter, you would agree to uh, work his land, and you would get into relationship with the other uh, 
with the other uh, grooms, with the other sons-in-law that they had who had married other daughters of the person who had worked the land and as such come into almost what was a, a, a co-op. And so by a kind of agreeing to enter into a contract of marriage or a contract of a relationship uh, union, you then agree to labor on behalf, you know, of what at that time would have been the equivalent of the family business. And as such, you can then see that it goes from like those sort of relations where it's based on like this, you know, kind of blood uh, communalism to something that's, you know, way more coercive, you know, talking about the ruling class and the state uh, for the first time, tore away the social institutions, which prevented the first embryo states from exercising direct action. They're literally attacking sovereignty. They're enforcing coercive relations. Uh, it said feudalism brought about a series of direct obligatory ties uh, between the landed rulers and the landless subjects, where before, under like the pre described uh, relation, for example, there was no coercion if you didn't want to work, you know. For that father, you just didn't have to get married, you know, to the person who um, that you didn't want, that you didn't have to get married to, and I said you wouldn't end up in a obligatory tie, you know. Everything was from this basically on how he's describing everything for the most part voluntary in a way that feudalism necessarily eroded away at. So I find it very interesting how things went from communal to obligatory, you know, over. The course of what it looks like is about two centuries. It's a, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty uh, dastardly how that happened. Uh, let's see, was anybody else saying anything? So Saber says the Timbuktu manuscripts, and he posted the Timbuktu manuscripts with the Arabic writings about mathematics and astronomy, and he posted the Great Mosque of Jan and Mali. So we'll make sure to get those on the video. And uh, yeah. If anybody else has anything to say, now's the time. Other than that, we can wrap up for this week, comrades. Well, well Saber and I are going to work together to make sure things get edited in order and we'll be able to edit out all the, all the stuff that we don't need. Other than that, thank you all for joining us today for this Walter Rodney reading. Uh, we'll finish uh, Chapter 2 next week and it'll uh, be good. So I think chapter two, I think it's going to be a shorter session because what we have remaining is only about 15 to 16 pages or so, maybe 18. But other than that, solidarity, comrades, I'll see you next week. We'll start black. We'll start inventing reality this Saturday. DPRK presentation next Monday. Uh, And yeah, y'all take care until then.